Good evening and thank you for joining us. Suspended Police Chief Sylvie Hoth has given her letter of resignation, pushing her retirement date up to January 27th. The letter was accepted by the Police Services Board during its meeting earlier today. Last year, Hoth announced her intention to retire effective this June. That announcement came just hours before the Ontario Civilian Police Commission revealed that Hoth is facing a notice of hearing for allegations of misconduct. As her retirement will now come before the hearing dates, Hoth will no longer be subject to those disciplinary proceedings. Acting Chief Dan Taddeo will continue to lead the service until a new chief is appointed. A media release from the Police Services Board states that no further comments will be provided regarding Hoth's resignation. A Windsor man who was the subject of an Ontario-wide arrest warrant has been taken into custody by Thunder Bay Police. 39-year-old Michael Allard was wanted in connection with a shooting incident in Kitchener. Allard was apprehended on Cumberland Street early Saturday morning. Waterloo Regional Police had considered him to be armed and dangerous when they issued an arrest warrant last month. Allard is a suspect in a September shooting at a motel in Kitchener. A 65-year-old man was found with a gunshot wound and he was taken to hospital with non-life-threatening injuries. A spokesperson for Waterloo Police says arrangements are currently being made for Thunder Bay Police to transfer Allard into their custody. Thunder Bay City Council is back in session at this hour for budget deliberations. Councillors also had some important projects to discuss last night, including a CEDC funding request for Lakehead University's proposed veterinary medicine program. Vasilios Bellows reports. It was unanimous approval by Thunder Bay City Council on Monday, allowing the CEDC to invest $500,000 towards Lakehead University's proposed veterinary program. This doesn't fully fund the program, which is targeting a fall 2024 launch, though applications for some dollars from the province and federal government are being considered. It comes as there is a shortage of vets in our region, with many having to travel to Dryden or even over the border to receive care for their animals, big and small. During the discussion, some councillors, including Rajni Agarwal, spoke to the importance of encouraging program graduates to stay within the region rather than seeking employment elsewhere. Well, there's never a guarantee that any student's ever going to stay in our city. It, they, they answered it saying they're going to try. But once you get people here, and they're going, to be better, they're going to be here for two years. The nice thing is they're recruiting from the north. So if we recruit from the north, they may want to come back home. Like home being northern Ontario, home being Thunder Bay. So we're not guaranteed on this return on investment, but we have an investment to make. Another unanimous decision during the meeting means the city will be calling on the provincial government to take significant action to tackle the worsening overdose crisis. It includes seeking expanded funding for addiction treatment options, including harm reduction approaches like safe supply programs and the decriminalization of simple drug possession. The issue has grown significantly in Thunder Bay, with Superior North EMS recording 729 opioid-related calls in 2021, that's up from 96 calls just four years ago. The memorandum was put forward by Councillor Kristen Oliver, who believes it's more important than ever to tackle the crisis. That we saw that happen through COVID, and I think a lot of what happened during COVID is certainly um, escalating what we're seeing now, right now in this community with the social crisis. Um, you know, as I did mention too, I've talked to mothers that have lost their children to uh, to drug poisoning, and, um, and it's just it's just growing and growing and growing. And next up for City Council is a budget meeting Tuesday night, which will be the first of four where any changes to the budget can be proposed and debated. As a reminder, heading into that meeting, the tax levy hike is sitting at 6.2% before growth and 5.6% after. Vasilios Bellows, TBT News. A warning to viewers now about a disturbing discovery out of Kenora. An investigation at the former St. Mary's Residential School grounds has found 171 anomalies that could be grave sites. The investigation was conducted in the former cemetery, and with the exception of five grave markers, the rest of the area is unmarked. The investigation began in May of last year and was carried out by the Wajishkanigam Nation. Chief Chris Skeed says these anomalies still need to be examined further, while the search for other potential burial sites continues. Skeed notes they'll need support from the provincial and federal governments, as other sites of interest are on private land. I am hopeful that these discussions will be productive. 
Canada and Ontario continue to say they are committed to reconciliation, to the truth, and to healing of our communities. I look forward to hearing if they will continue to honour these commitments. Ontario Minister Greg Rickford has issued a statement calling the news from Wajishkanigam heartbreaking and noting he joins all Treaty 3 partners in mourning the discovery. He acknowledges that this is a tragic first here in Ontario. Rickford met with Skeed and offered Ontario's full support during this difficult time. He says his government will continue working with partners to assist with the next phase of this work to help uncover the truth of the Indian residential school system. The NAN Chief's Winter Assembly has begun in Thunder Bay with an appearance by Ontario Solicitor General Michael Kersner. He was challenged today by several NAN Chiefs on the Community Safety and Policing Act, which would impact Nishnabiaski police. And Niskantiga Chief Wayne Munez is calling for more than just a promise. Mitchell Ringo's reports. As a nation, to nation, can you formally say that we are going to deliver within a certain timeline, as you stated, not just mere words, something that we can tell our people back home. This question came after Solicitor General Michael Kersner's speech to NAN chiefs, where he stated that the government's plan is to have the CSPA enacted within a year. The agreement would make First Nations policing an essential service and improve its funding formula, and even though he cannot provide a formal commitment here, Kersner did offer this. I want to keep everyone informed as to what's happening along the way. And I think this will show the goodwill when there's the transparency of where we are. We're in the last lap. We know it. The pandemic was a pandemic. Minister Jones was an excellent steward to get us to where we are today. I have to complete the job and you can count on me to do that. Grand Chief Derek Fox said he did believe what the Solicitor General said and appreciated the tough questions, saying it is the Chief's job to advocate and push for what is needed in their communities. Fox did say, however, more is needed, as even over the holidays, many communities could have declared a state of emergency. Those within the communities can only deal with so much, and, and you're, you're hit constantly with that loss and crisis. Um, you burn out and, and uh, when enough people burn out that state of emergency is, 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 is much needed. The NAN Chiefs Winter Assembly will continue on Wednesday and Thursday and Fox says over the next two days many more topics and proposals are going to be brought up and he is hoping more positive progress can come out of this. Mitchell Ringos, TBT News. Community open houses are being held in Atacokan this evening and in Dryden tomorrow on the preferred route for the Wasagin Transmission Line project. The first open house was held in Thunder Bay last night, where officials with Hydro One spoke about the next steps. Mike Lang has the details. Since March of 2022, an environmental assessment has been taking place under Ontario's Environmental Assessment Act to build a new double-circuit 230 kilovolt transmission line between Shunia and Atacokan before transitioning north to a single-circuit 230 kilovolt line to Dryden. And now a new preliminary preferred route has been proposed, giving locals a chance to learn more and give feedback at the three open houses. Vice President of Stakeholder Relations for Hydro One, Daniel Levitan, says talking to locals is essential to move this project to the next stage. We want as much feedback as possible because that gives us the confidence that, you know, in the end, we're going to be a neighbor. And we're going to be a member of the community, just like any other, uh, you know, any other building or, or business. Uh, we want to be a good neighbor. And we talked to a few of the over 70 in attendance at Thunder Bay's open house about why they decide to show up and what benefits or feedback they had for the transmission line. No major concerns yet. It's interesting to see, I guess, the information that's shared with the public, um, as I have like a little bit of a background in forestry and, and environmental work. You're talking about a lot of employment, a lot of spin-off employment, a lot of trickle-down economic benefit going to the community in every single way. Levitan says it will take some time before the route is set in stone, but once the line is built, 350 megawatts of electricity will be added to the region. But Levitan says power isn't the only benefit that will be seen from this project. So if there's an opportunity to build that labor market, uh, and to procure as much as we can locally, that's our top priority. So we're starting from that perspective. And I think as we 
go down this path, we're going to get to, uh, I would say, uh, a more refined idea as to how many jobs, what types of jobs, uh, what local suppliers we can take advantage of, First Nations and, and non-Indigenous. Uh, and for those who couldn't make it to one of the open houses, virtual tours are available on the Hydro One website, which Levitan says will be updated as the project progresses. Mike Lang, TBT News. He was once one of Ontario's most powerful union leaders, but now former OPSU president Warren Smokey Thomas, along with two other former executives, is the focus of a $6 million lawsuit filed by the union. Zareda Alman explains. The statement of claim filed in Superior Court by OPSU is seeking damages of over $6 million. Former President Warren Smokey Thomas and two others, former Vice President Eduardo Almeida and former Financial Administrator Maurice Gabay are named in the suit. It alleges that throughout their tenures, Thomas and Almeida paid themselves significant compensation to which they were not entitled, paid themselves expenses for non-business related purposes, transferred union assets in the form of vehicles to themselves or family members for free, paid themselves from the union strike fund and entered into inappropriate agreements to enrich themselves. It also alleges Maurice Gabay, who worked as a financial administrator, conspired and colluded with the other two. In a letter to union members and staff, current president J.P. Hornick says numerous concerns came to light during a forensic audit initiated shortly after the new board's election in April. In her statement, Hornick assures members the union's finances continue to be stable and action has been and continues to be taken to ensure this doesn't happen again. I want to be clear to you, our staff and members and the people of Ontario who we dutifully serve, that we will not waver in our commitment to seeking justice in this matter and we have the full support of the board to pursue all available legal avenues. OPSU is one of the largest public sector unions in the province with more than 180,000 members. Zarad Allman, CTV News. It's been almost a decade since the Boston Marathon bombing. The deadly explosions happened shortly after Thunder Bay runner Natalie Lado crossed the finish line. Now, 10 years later, she's written a book about her healing journey from that traumatic moment. I have been struggling up and down emotionally inside, kind of quietly over the years. And I decided a few years back that the best way I knew how to start coping was just to sit down and start writing out my story and my feelings. Lado suffered through years of PTSD and other lingering mental health effects from that April day in 2013, but overcoming those challenges allowed her to develop a new philosophy that keeps her strong no matter what life throws at her. Lado's book, titled Like the Glide of a Dragonfly, is now available at local bookstores. She says the turning point for her was when she realized that she needs to set an example for her three children. That's what she hopes to convey to people who read her book. Everybody goes through something. How do you choose to keep moving forward? How do you choose to keep finishing things strong? Or, And for me, that's the biggest message in the book is we need to find ways to keep going. And those ways might change over your lifetime as we age or as, you know, situations intensify, but you need to keep finding your way. Lado will be at the Finnish bookstore for a book signing this Saturday afternoon from 1 to 3. The weather this January has definitely been a lot warmer than usual, but according to Environment Canada, we're still a ways off from the all-time record for the first half of the month that was set just two years ago. The normal daily high for this time of year is minus 8.8 Celsius, and we've exceeded that every single day this month. From January 1st until today, the daily high has averaged minus 2.3 degrees. But that's still 2 degrees colder than we saw in January 2021. Most of the nights have been milder as well, with the mean temperature averaging minus 6.9 degrees. But once again, the temps in January 2021 were even warmer, at more than 9 degrees over the norm. However, the mercury dropped considerably in the second half of January 2021, whereas the mild conditions this year are expected to continue until the last week of the month. Well, Mitch, and those, wi uh, those mild, uh, yeah, we can call it wild, wild I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> That's been a bit of a wild January. Those mild temperatures uh, continued 
today as we can yes. see that weather graphic behind you. And like you were saying, we didn't break any records like we saw, but the temperatures, those highs still above average for this time of year. We saw it again today, temperature jumping up to one. The low was actually later in the day down to minus three. Now we did see some early snow and freezing drizzle this morning along with some rain. Now it did cause some impacts for the roads as a lot of slushy snow. The driving conditions were not very good and that continued heading into the rest of the day at the moment. I'm not sure exactly how the roads are, but we're still seeing a little bit of that snow in the area. As for the window from northwest 5 to 22 kilometers. Now, as we head to the region, the conditions continue farther west, similar to Thunder Bay, some freezing drizzle and snow throughout the day. They're expecting some light flurries throughout the night. Currently, some cloudy skies at minus 4 that carrying over to Atacokan and Uppsala. But first, farther northwest, a little bit colder, closer to that average high, and minus 10 in Red Lake at the moment, minus 13 in Pickle Lake, seeing some partly cloudy skies. They had similar conditions, expecting some snow on the way. A little more snow as we head to Armstrong and Greenstone. Temperatures similar as well, down to minus 8. They're going to see anywhere from 2 to 4 centimeters tonight. And farther east, temperature does warm up to 2 in Sault Ste. Marie. So they saw plenty of rain throughout the day. Also expecting more rain heading into tonight. Now, as for Thunder Bay, we're also going to see a little bit more snow tonight. Around 1 to 2 centimeters, that's not going to stick and hang out for far too long. Temperature, though, dropping down to minus 13, feeling like minus 17, and the wind is going to jump up from the northwest to 37 kilometers an hour. So just a heads up with all that slushy snow and the cooler temperatures heading into tonight. Just be safe on the road. Absolutely. Thanks a lot, Mitch. Well, we got a little bit of good financial news today. Inflation has slowed slightly uh, in the month of December. Of course, we still know that the prices are still up substantially over this time last year. We'll have all those details as your Tuesday News Hour still continues. Seems up and down. Some days it seems like it's a deal and other days it's way up again.